Welcome to the podcast hosted by TanCam.com on how to stay on top of your work. Welcome back. This is Kate with another episode of the podcast Stay on Top of Your Work. And today my guest is Linda Fisher Thornton. Linda is the CEO of Leading in Context, an ethical leadership development consulting firm. She is the author of the award-winning and best-selling book, Seven Lenses, Learning the Principles and Practices of Ethical Leadership. Now the book is in its second printing. She is in the top 100 leadership speakers for 2018 in ENC Magazine, and her Leading in Context blog is in the top 100 socially shared leadership blogs. Linda has also been honored by Trusty Trust Across America with a Lifetime Achievement Award for her work. Linda, I'm happy that you joined me here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question. Can you say a little more about yourself and what are your professional interests? Sure. I'm interested in ethical leadership development. Most people are familiar with leadership development, leaders learning how to do their jobs more effectively. I focus specifically on ethical thinking and ethical action, helping leaders see way beyond the profit of something to their full impact so that they can understand how to make good decisions and uh, develop good interpersonal relationships that are respectful and that sort of thing. I was a senior vice president and chief learning officer for a bank and teaching leadership. And I noticed there was this gap in the leadership models uh, that people were talking about good leadership in ways that didn't include ethical values. And I just knew that something was wrong with that. And the training on, on ethics and values was usually separate. But if you learn something separately, it's very difficult to put the pieces back together when you need to apply it, when you have tight deadlines and rapid change and you're trying to make a good leadership choice, it's very difficult to figure out on your own how to put leadership and values back together. So I started looking at some questions that we didn't have the answers to that I thought we needed answers to, like what is ethical leadership and why can't we agree on a definition? Why is everyone describing it so differently? And how can leaders learn it if we can't even explain what it is? How can we bring it to life for them in a practical way? Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about uh, the ethical leadership a little bit uh, later, but now I'd like to uh, ask you, what are the, the the good sides that a leader should have, or maybe what are just the basic skills that a leader, a good leader should have, according to you? There are many different aspects to that. One of the things that I do is look at the multiple dimensions of things. Uh, work is really complex and leaders have to deal with changing laws, increasing expectations for ethical business, rapid change, and so, one of the things that it means to be a good leader is to understand that consumers are expecting more. Um, social media means that people are aware of bad decisions and people want to support good companies when they buy. They don't want to be associated with an unethical company. So, uh, And also when companies are ethical, they tend to treat people well and then employees will treat customers well and that will attract more, more uh, customers and it creates a, a positive cycle for the organization. So today's employees are looking for a leader who makes time for them and helps bring out their best, helps them further their career, and is also making a difference in the community and in the world, not just someone who treats them well, but someone who is making a positive difference and someone who inspires them to really be better than they thought they could be, you know, someone that really stretches them a little bit outside of their comfort zone to, to um, reach their potential. And the qualities of a leader will determine whether or not that leader is going to be able to attract top talent to the organization and to their team. And um, when they're trustworthy and, and demonstrate integrity, uh, when they have consistency, between what they think and say and do, and people can count on them. Uh, and when they make it clear that they know that leadership isn't about them, it's about leading others, it's about bringing out the best in others, then 
that kind of leader will attract top talent to the organization. And one of the most important things that leaders need to do is to understand the context in which they lead. And it's changing so rapidly. It's it's a very difficult thing to stay on top of. So they have to be open to learning. They have to be willing to accept and explore the complexity of our work, our workplaces, and our world. Uh, often the ethical mistakes we hear about in the news happen because people don't take time to think about the ripple effect of their decisions before they make them. And we really have to consider the needs of multiple stakeholders. They all might have different needs. And we have to stay on top of changing expectations for what good business means. And those expectations are increasing as time goes on. And I wanted to ask you, uh, why do people fail as leaders? But I think you answered that question in, in some part. But do you think there's maybe something else that uh, the reason for which people fail as leaders? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes they don't think about what they're, they're deciding before they do it or how they're treating people. But there are also many, there are dozens or hundreds of reasons why things can go wrong. Uh, and I have written about this on my blog. It's, it could be an individual problem. Uh, the person isn't self-aware. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not competent. Um, they're not stopping to think about what's going on. Um, they might be um, giving into their ego or greed or all, all sorts of problems in, in their decision making. Or they might be just responding to the culture of the organization. Maybe someone in the organization who, who broke the rules um, and did some bad things, maybe they got promoted. And maybe this person says, oh, well, that guy got promoted. So I'm going to do what he did so I can get promoted. So it's partly also the organization's expectations, how clear they are, and um, whether people are following the lead of, of other people who may not be using the highest ethics because that's allowed or sometimes even encouraged in the culture. So it could be individual things. It could be um, more related to what's going on in the organization. But there are, you know, probably hundreds of different ways that things can go wrong, which is why this is such a complex topic. Mm -hmm. And do you think that maybe there are some particular methods or practices which can help in, in avoiding that or making us a better leader? Or maybe it's not worth to, uh, to pay attention to such practices or concepts? I think what we can do is not oversimplify. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm trying to help people realize is that we, it's easy to oversimplify decisions and not really look at the bigger picture, look at the context, look at your role in it, you know, your responsibility to others, a broad array of others. Um, and we've, we've defined ethical leadership so narrowly. You know, some people would say, oh, it's, it's having good character. Well, I think it is having good character, but it's also many other things uh, like taking care of the planet and taking care of people and many other aspects. So we need to stop boiling it down to just one or two things and look at the multiple dimensions of it because a choice could be ethical uh, in terms of uh, people, for example, but it might be a terrible decision in terms of the planet. So it's not as simple as is something ethical or not. It is how ethical is it in all of these different dimensions. And my book is called Seven Lenses because I believe there are seven different dimensions of ethical responsibility that we need to think about uh, in our leadership, not just in our individual decisions, but also in you know, our strategies and our goals and our approaches. So not, not oversimplifying things to, you know, yeah, that seems like a good choice, but let me look at this really using a framework that will help me make sure I don't forget something. Mm -hmm. um, so the most important question is, what is an ethical leadership? Yes. Um, my book, Seven Lenses, defines ethical leadership in, in seven 
uh, different areas of responsibility. And I'll, I'll walk you through that a little bit just so everyone can understand what they are. Um, only when you put all of them together do you see the whole picture of ethical responsibility instead of just looking at it in terms of one perspective. Now, profit is included in the seven lenses because I wanted to help leaders get past thinking that profit and ethics uh, were mutually exclusive that they and to see that they really have to go together. And also, many people have thought that triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet was all they had to worry about in terms of ethics. And it's really not quite that simple. So I wanted them to see how those elements fit into a bigger framework. Um, because profit is important because organizations have to stay in business. Even nonprofits have to manage money and fundraising and, and handle money responsibly. Um, so, but, so they have to keep their organizations afloat and think about money. But ethics at its best is when we set aside concerns about money and personal gain and do things that are best for others. That's really what the essence of ethics is about. So to introduce you to the seven lenses, lens one is profit. How much money will it make? Uh, lens two is law. How can we honor all laws and regulations? Laws are the minimum standard of acceptable behavior in a society. So we move on to lens three, which is character. How can we demonstrate moral awareness and competence? And this one is really important and so often overlooked. Lens four is people. How can we respect and care for people and bring out their best? And lens five is communities. How can we improve life in the communities we serve? And lens six is the planet. How can we protect life, nature, and ecosystems? And lens seven is the greater good. This is the highest level and the longest term of all of the perspectives. How can we make life better for future generations long after we're gone. And this is about leaving a positive legacy through our leadership. So only when we look at our choices through all seven of those perspectives, do we see the whole picture. And instead, everyone has been tending to look at one thing or even maybe two for lucky and make a decision without looking at the longer term impact. So this model has those longer term um, constituent stakeholders built into it so that it helps people think through them. Uh, and the beauty of it when I work with groups is that um, we can remember seven things. It has the same number of digits as a local telephone number. So it's easy for people to remember when they don't have their materials in front of them, you know, to kind of go through it as a mental checklist to make sure that the decisions they're making are going to be positive in all of those different areas. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about these seven lenses, I, I was thinking about uh, people and because I think they all kind of constitute uh, how we treat other people also. And how do you think we can lead a team as a leader? how to make it in a good, in the best way, considering uh, the ethics? That's a great question. Uh, people want to be treated well. And they want to have meaningful work. And how their leaders treat them tells them whether or not they matter to the organization. So leaders have to show they care about people. And some of the ways they do that, they show respect for others as individuals, but also respect for differences. As seeing differences as an asset to the organization. Those different perspectives help um, bring them the full picture when they're doing projects and that sort of thing. And it has to, we have to show that we want people to succeed and we have to put our full support behind their success. And um, also the people lens asks us to think about avoiding harm to people. So if we're manufacturing a product that makes safety really important. You know, how can we make sure that we're making the best decisions um, to treat people well? And when when we treat people well, it creates a positive cycle within the organization that helps uh, drive bottom line results. So what happens is when you are giving this kind of caring, respectful leadership throughout the organization, 
great talent wants to come work for that company because it's such a positive environment and, and then has a high, generally will have a high level of trust. And then, then employees are highly engaged in settings like that and they're happy with their work. They want to stay and then they're going to delight your customers and your customers are going to want to stay. And it, the whole process increases productivity and drives increased profits and return on assets and really gives the company a competitive advantage where we have learned that ethics isn't just the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do. It's also the right thing to do because it drives the economic engine of the organization today. And we know this. So this kind of positive leadership, um, leaders have to live out their values, not just talk about them. Uh, one thing we know is that most companies have stated values, but not very many of those companies, less than half, actually live them out consistently on a daily basis. So people say, yeah, we have this, but I don't see this happening you know, in the organization. And so when you say respect is a value, for example, you have to treat every person with the highest respect, even when you're having a bad day, or even when someone didn't treat you with respect, you still have to treat others uh, with respect and rise above the distractions of leadership to make people feel valued and create those high, uh, safe, high trust workplaces. And yeah, keep going. Um, I'd like to ask you also, because you, you mentioned treating people and making decisions, what should a leader consider when making a decision and when it comes to treating other people as well? Well, that's a good question. Um, one of the things in my book it is besides the seven lenses, it also has 14 guiding principles of ethical leadership in four quadrants. And quadrant two is lead in ways that bring out the best in others. And that is so important. It's about um, trusting others to do a good job and being trustworthy for them, communicating as much as you can openly and transparently with people uh, and respecting others, respecting boundaries, respecting differences, all the things that create that positive environment. And also leading in ways that help others be ethical. And when that that's an important piece for leaders because some leaders will say one thing and do another. So for example, if there's required uh, ethics training and a manager just slips in the back, comes in late, you know, sits there for 15 minutes and then leaves, then the message to the people in that training session is, this is not important. This isn't worth my time. And so they're more likely to see that as not important and they're less likely to apply what they're learning there. So that leader would not be uh, leading in ways that would lead other people to be ethical. So you have to be that role model. You have to give them something positive as an example so that they know what to follow in addition to uh, making taking care on, on how we treat people on a daily basis. And how do you think we can manage a risk as a leader? Is it possible somehow to predict a risk? And I mean like the entire company, the risk connected with people, with profits, money in general, with every aspect of the company. It's an interesting question because it depends on how you define risk. Some companies define that really narrowly, like let's not get sued. <laughs> and so if you think risk means let's not get sued, then you're you're thinking through the law lens. It's just very low level, but it's important. So you, you do things to stay out of jail and you don't want to get fined and you don't want to uh, get sued. The problem with managing risk at that low level is you're not taking into consideration all these things we just talked about, about how to treat people well. And that's at a much higher level than just avoiding, you know, the fines and penalties, but people have higher expectations for how they're treated now. We have laws that prevent bullying in the workplace. We have learned um, that leaders that create a high stress environment and intentionally um, treat people negatively affect their health. You know, people have 
much higher incidence of diseases and health problems in environments like that. And so there's there's less tolerance for um, treating people that way. So I think one of the most important ways to reduce risk is to aim higher when we're talking about values, not just to aim at the level of um, not, you know, staying out of jail or avoiding a fine or, or penalty, but really aiming aiming at the level of the values because laws generally have values behind them, but you don't it's not written in. You have to figure out what it is. So the law that says uh, we can't um, hit each other in the workplace, really the value there is human rights, human dignity. Uh, and so the, the laws will tend to have the values behind them, but we have to figure out what those values are and then reach at that level, uh, the human rights, dignity, respect, reach at that level, not just at the level of um, following what the law says, because the law is just the minimum standard to stay out of trouble in a society, and that's aiming way too low. So I think the best way to manage risk is to aim higher at the level of the positive ethical values when you're when you're helping leaders know what to do. Then, if you tell them human rights and human dignity is important, then that rules out a lot of negative things that they might want to do. They might say, "Oh yeah, that doesn't support our value here." of this. And so then they don't have to just think at the level of, is that allowed by law, but is that supported by these important values? Mm -hmm. So you said about aiming higher and I'm thinking, how can we, how can a company stand out among the competitors and how to make a difference? That's a great question. There's something now that's really important called ethical brand value, EBV. And it's a real differentiator uh, and it's tied directly to the bottom line results of a company. And people look at the ethical brand of a company and they use that to help make decisions. And there's some reasons why uh, ethics impacts the value of a company and the value of a brand. And that's because customers are thinking more before they buy about the ethics of a company. And they're looking closely at that and they want to make more often responsible consumption decisions. You know, I, if I can buy something that was made using um, appropriate labor, not child slave labor or any of the things that I wouldn't want associated with me, then I'm making a positive decision. And so they vote in a way for ethical businesses by purchasing from them. And they expect companies to be ethical. And when companies aren't ethical, don't treat people well, of course, that's all over social media, and that immediately can cause the stock price of a company to drop because people say, oh, this is not good. This is not the way we want to be treated. This must not be an ethical brand, and it, it pulls, it pulls, literally pulls the, um, the financial indicators of a company down, at least for a while, while the company tries to figure out how do we prevent that from happening again? How do we send the positive message that that we are an, an ethical brand, we are an ethical company? So um, helping leaders learn how to think about these issues and how to keep the company ethical um, and make a positive contribution. And one of the things that we also have to think about is a lot of the problems that end up on social media may not be done by leaders. They might be done by lower level employees who didn't get the message that ethics was so important in the company. So leaders have to spread that word. They, they instead of just talking about their sales goals, they have to set, talk just as much about responsible business practices and ethics. Otherwise people might think that profit is more important to them than ethics. And they might think that means do whatever it takes you know, to, to get where you wanna go. Uh, so leaders have to not just uh, live out the values, but teach all of those that, that are in, on their teams how to do it so that mistakes don't crop up from people not understanding um, how important that ethical brand value is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also like you about your book, The Seven Lenses, which is now in its second printing. Uh, what inspired you to write it? That's an interesting story. I, I mentioned that I had been noticing a gap um, between 
you know, in what the leadership model said about good leadership and not including the values built in. And I attended a symposium at the University of Richmond where I teach, and uh, it was about ethical leadership. And every speaker was really intelligent and it was very, a fabulous conference. But I left with the big question. There were speakers on things like sustainability and information privacy and p- political ethics. And every topic was interesting. But I left thinking, how does all this fit together? If, the, if I need some bigger picture to help me understand how all these things relate to each other, you know, where's the framework? So I went back and looked for that framework. Certainly someone had put this together, right? And there wasn't one that explained it all. So I started um, sort of a half-hearted attempt to make such a framework. And then later I ended up really putting my full efforts into researching for several years and developing this model because I felt like there were so many leaders who wanted to do the right thing, but they didn't exactly know what that meant. They needed a guidebook on uh, what does that look like in action? And all the principles um, in the book have examples, case studies, where it describes in vivid detail what it looks like in the workplace. So people could say, okay, yes, I'm, I recognize that. That's either what I'm doing or not what I'm doing. I need to make a change here. Um, so I wanted them to have that roadmap because it just seemed like it was just a giant gap where a tool should be. And so I, I undertook the, the journey of doing that research uh, across disciplines to find out what people thought good business meant. And I didn't just look at what it, the ethicists throughout time had said and in, in all different countries, but what I looked at what the emerging groups were saying about good leadership, the global groups um, through the United Nations, the co-roundtable and organizations that were saying, here's the high standard we think we should be aiming for. And then I put all of that together in a giant spreadsheet to try to make sense out of this in a way that leaders could end up with something simple enough and straightforward enough that they could apply it in their daily leadership. And I'm I'm really excited about the second printing because I think what it says is that it's the right tool for them at the right time. There's a lot going on in the world right now, highly complex ethical issues. And so I think it's timely for people to have such a tool to help them see the nuances of of ethics as they are going along in their leadership and wanting to make it positive. Yes, the book sounds great and really inspiring, and I believe everyone should read it, especially people who want to become leaders. Uh, and tell me, what books do you read to maybe get in, get inspired and to stay on top of your work? I like a wide variety of books. I like to read about ethics and human development and leadership. I like books about systems thinking and other kinds of leadership thinking, um, books that are focused on the future and also how to work better together. I'm currently reading Radical Candor by Kim Scott uh, with for one of the book clubs that I'm in. But I, I like books by Robert Keegan and Everyone Culture, for example, and books by Daniel Pink. Chip and Dan Heath, uh, Margaret Wheatley. There are just so many, there's so many um, good authors, but those are some examples of some of the books that I enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask if there is the number one rule in your your work, which you cannot imagine your work without. I'm going to have to say that number one rule would be don't oversimplify. Uh, Look at the dimensions of something. Uh, Look from more than one perspective to understand things better. I think we're learning in the world that looking from one perspective and then trying to explain something isn't going to work. It isn't going to give people a sense that you really understand something and they won't have a high level of confidence, but you really need to look um, across the disciplines because disciplines, you know, things like science and education, those are artificial boundaries that we set up to learn more about something, we drew a box around it, but those artificial boxes don't live in the real world. So our problems don't stay inside discipline boundaries, they cross those boundaries. So we really need to be 
learning across those boundaries and um, to understand what's happening in the world. And I researched my book that way, looking across um, the traditional disciplines that one might look at in terms of understanding ethics and leadership. So don't oversimplify, dig into it, uh, look at things from more than one perspective. And my last question would be, uh, it's connected with the, the name of the podcast, Stay on Top of Your Work. How do you stay on top of your work? Yes, it's a constant challenge. As for all of us, I, I am working on uh, doing more digitizing, streamlining, uh, keeping my work focused, more focused. Um, I'm always learning. One of the things I always make time for is, is learning new things uh, because I think that's so critical. And making time to think. Uh, a lot of leaders don't make time to think, but I think that's really important if you're about to undertake a big project or some important work, taking time to think about what your goals are, what your stakeholders are looking for and how you can add value for them. And um, I also see the technology tools as critical to our future as we take on more work. Um, we need to use the tools that make it simpler uh, and they help us stay organized and focused. And one of the big challenges that I am currently looking to is that when we are designing uh, tools, including artificial intelligence, we have to make sure that ethical thinking is built in uh, because as we get more and more reliant on artificial intelligence, we need to make sure that people are cared for from an ethical standpoint, things like the data privacy, their safety, preventing harm to them. So that's something I'm currently researching is the, the, the whole ethics of um, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence is such a huge issue um, for our future. Linda, thank you very much for your for your useful tips and your uh, answers. It was my pleasure to talk to you and I wish you all the best. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we got some really useful tips from Linda today. I encourage you to visit her website at leadingincontext.com and read her book, Seven Lenses. Let me know in comments if you enjoyed the podcast and what you'd like me to talk about with my future guests. Stay tuned for more and until next time. This podcast was brought to you by Tenkan. You can listen to it on iTunes and SoundCloud. Subscribe to get more content and always stay on top of your work.